In 1976, due to recurring injury, Marcello Fiascanaro, South African world record holder for the 800 meters, was finally forced to give up on his ultimate dream, to take gold at the Olympic Games. Back home in South Africa, in June of that year, students in Soweto staged a peaceful protest against the system of so-called Bantu education. Police opened fire. Many students were killed and wounded. South Africa would never be the same again. Hanging up his shoes, Marcello retired with the world, Italian and South African 800 meter records under his belt. As for the Olympic Games, it would take 20 years before another South African would fulfill Marcello's unrequited dream in the 800 meters. 20 years on, in 1996, South Africa would be a different country. The policy of apartheid would be no more. Black and white South Africans would be free to represent their united and democratic country as South Africans. Back in 1976, in the old South Africa, Ezekiel Sapeng was a two-year-old toddler growing up on a farm on the outskirts of Potchefstroom. I was born in Pachaf's room, a small farm called Achnar, which is in Boskop, uh, that area. We are six, four boys and two girls, so I'm the one in the middle here. I'm between the two girls. My father worked as a driver at the farm, where we stayed in uh, Achnar, and my mom, she works in town as a domestic woman. I get by the place, by the dorp, work. I two kilo and a half. Before I the stop, every morning after my rag, I go again. He is too. The water was up there. You must water and draw. Mnier, it's good. It's good when you open it. My primary school was still at the farm, Achnar. The name of the school is uh, Tarapikana. After school, we will go into the field, assisting with planting. We are too on on school transport. On set never we this apart. On set think this the life. On set never see me. Where I come from, the Achnar farm. There was a mountain where the sun will always go behind it, and it will rise again. I thought actually what's happening, where the sun drops, that's overseas. I only wanted to go up into that mountain and probably I will see overseas. I've never been overseas. I've never seen even Johannesburg, the city. The only town that I knew was when I go into Pochef's room, into town with my mom. That was the area that I know, but in the farm, that was my life. Zika grew up as a child of uh, typical farm workers. Just an ordinary boy that went to the local farm school. I believe today that those years from approximately seven to about 16 years old, where Ezekiel had to run to and from school every day, which we covered was probably 10 in the morning and 10 kilometers in the afternoon, made a foundation that later in his running career played a big contribution to his performances. Success is determined not only about the talent that you've got, but the passion, the desire, the hunger that you really want. Ezekiel really wanted to be the best, and that made him good. But when he was really, really hungry, combined with talent, combined with a strong mind, he was invincible. My main sports that I played at that time was soccer. My favorite team is the Kaiser Chiefs. And uh, as a young boy that is growing up, I wanted to play a professional football. I was good at it, a striker, and uh, I always scored when we played there. Yeah. With soccer his passion, Ezekiel had never considered athletics. It was Kaiser Pakati. 
from an adjoining farm who ran informal athletics camps with his brothers and other youngsters from the farming communities that first identified Ezekiel's potential and convinced him to take up running. I think 1988 it was the Olympic Games in Seoul and uh, having seen the structure of Ezekiel whilst he's playing soccer and Ezekiel's build was more or less like most of the Kenyans. And, and having watched the 1988 Olympics, the 800 meters was won by the Kenyans, one, two, and three. And the 1500 meters and the 5000 meters. And that's when I started realizing his body structure. It's similar to the Kenyans. And then he must start considering running rather than soccer. The main reason for me to join athletics was to keep me busy as as, as a young guy because I, I was at stage when I, I'm with friends that will influence me to do wrong things, you know, what happened in those days. It was anerkend, he was big last He was big last All the time, he went to the door to work soon, and he's still there. One day, I think, he's a kid, he's a He said, the kissing in the way is weg. Do you go? That's the man says kissing and you. And the air is good. The cell is there. I see the police come, the kill is up. My kinder says, how far do I was caught with a bicycle which I, I, I got from my friend, and that bicycle was stolen. I was so scared. My kind of drunk to him. I like to come to that man. And I fought the feet, and the police fought for that man. I turned from there and I said, look, if I continue doing what I'm doing with my friends, probably I will end up being in, in jail. And that's why I started running, joining Keza and, and, and his brothers and, and then started training with them here. Yeah. After decades of border war, internal township insurrection, states of emergency with accompanying security force brutality, and international boycotts and isolation, at the end of 1989, the apartheid regime was finally brought to its knees. Liberation movements were unbanned, and political prisoners released from incarceration. Political exiles were free to return home. A process of negotiation saw Nelson Mandela released on the 11th of February 1990 and a commitment by the ruling regime towards South Africa's first free and democratic elections. But for many it was a time of uncertainty as third force elements sought to destabilize negotiations for a peaceful transition to democracy. On many farms across the country, in the face of suspicion that a new black government would give land rights to farm laborers who had lived and worked on the farms for generations, mass evictions of laborers and their families took place. After the great icon was released, Oli Tatla Madiba Mandela, 1990 February, on a farm we would live in fear because you would be asked who's your next president. Do you like Mandela? You'll be asked by whites in the farm. And actually, where Sipen used to stay, people were moved off the land. Fortunately, in our case, it did not happen that way. We voluntarily decided, no, we need to take safety first, and then we moved to the Ikahen Township. Moving into Ikahen, life is better than the farm. Where we were staying at the farm, there was no track. We would always do our things on the road. And uh, moving into Ikachen, there was a track. Although it was not a tartan track, there was a track where we can train, we can measure our distances and stuff. I was at Clockwork High School. One of the coach that was coaching the MS, Johnny Secano, came and said, look, Posh Boys is looking for four athletes that can come for schooling in Posh Boys. They will pay everything. The headmaster of the time, John Blake, was quite visionary in his approach. 
he realized that there's going to be changes in South Africa. We just felt it was an essential opportunity that we had at this time to introduce black pupils to the school. I was just telling myself, I want to go to the white school. You know, it looked nice. It's order. And I was curious. I will always see these guys at, uh, in town with the uniform, walking there, tall, proud of themselves. I wanted to be in that environment and, and see how it is. So I said, and, and what, what would you have done if you hadn't come here? Well, I was thinking of going to the mine because I'm old enough to now go and work and I need to bring money in for the family. So I said, Ezekiel, I hope you decide to stay here because I think you'll fit into Poch Boys High. We wrote the aptitude test because they wanted to see if our maths and English is up to scratch. I was the only one who passed. And he came out with flying colours, which was most heartening, because I had taken immediate like to Ezekiel, and he came along as a young guy into that school, and immediately won friends. He was clearly an outstanding sportsman, and he was very humble along with it, and he just knew that he could run, and <laughs> that's what he did. <laughs> Die meneer van boys, hy roep my, hy sê, ons gaan jou kind wat, ek sê, meneer, ek het nie geheld nie. Ek kan nie. Man, by die school, by die school, ek patal 20 rand a jaar. En ek het nie geheld nie, ek kan nie om. Nee, meneer sê, ons vra net jou kind, ons gaan alles doen vir hom. Ah, ek het net gesê, dankie hier, hier is goed vir my. We organised things for him, we got him sorted out with his uniform, and he always felt so proud about his Poch Boys High uniform. So, uh, no, we, we organised that. We made sure that he was a proper Poch Boy. As the arm is, but you can go to the work of people in school. I was so happy. And I think that he did good. I can say that he is not the same. He is the same. He is the same. It was electrifying. I knew that what I dreamed of the place is going to happen because there's going to then be well resourced and it's going to be well managed, there's going to be well academic support, life skills and everything. I was honestly speaking, I was very excited for the young man. At that stage, Ezekiel was not admitted to the school's hostel yet. He stayed in a tin house in the, the local settlement and um, I knew that there's no ways that on the diet that he most probably ate that the, the conditions under which he slept was conducive to make any improvement. I had to stay there at that school until 5 o'clock where we start training. And I remember going to JP Fanel Mever at that time as a, a school coach and said, look, I, I can't afford to, to stay here. I, after school, I'm staying here. Other kids are eating and I still have to train. I get home late. And getting home late, I still have to go, look, where can we get the food to eat, me and my sister and a brother. So I spoke to the headmaster. We moved Ezekiel into the hostel. We structured his meals and gave him a bed and the proper accommodation to sleep in. And then, obviously, that combined with a structured training program and this tremendous background of aerobic training soon paid big dividends. Getting to the hostel, we have to wear certain clothes. I was lucky enough, all the kids from the hostel I was staying, which is Granton House, all of them donated clothes for me. My locker was full. The school gave me a school uniform. One of the basic principles of a distance runner is his shoes. And Ezekiel, the shoes that he had was old and tattered and weathered. At that stage, I had a pair of running shoes and I thought that uh, he was gonna benefit more from my running shoes than I was gonna benefit. So I gave him my running shoes so that he could train in it. He's the first big competition came with the annual inter-schools meeting, which is held in Poch's room. This is where it all started. Just across the stadium, it's Poch Boys, where I used to school. 
and stay there in the hostel. So uh, my career started here. That is a big challenge because there you have, especially from the old Afrikaans schools, strong competitors that has been used to years of good coaching and training and that have been exposed to, to this type of competition. And his real big test came that year. Strong competitors and years of good coaching aside, in 1990, the Interhur was a foreboding challenge for both the executive staff of Pochefstroom Boys High and their young black protege, Ezekiel Sepeng. Pochefstroom was in the heart of conservative and reactionary white South Africa. 60 kilometers up the road, Fentersdorp was the stronghold of Eugene Terreblanche and their extreme right-wing Afrikaner Wierstand Bewegung. With the release of Nelson Mandela and the unbanning of the liberation movements, Eugene Terreblanche was mobilizing his supporters to subvert any chance of the united, non-racial democracy being mooted. Fentersdorp would be the bastion capital of the all-white Volkstadt, or homeland envisioned. Under these circumstances in the 1990 environment of Potchefstroom and the Northwest, racial tensions were running high. Yeah, those days, you know, it was first time that black athletes were allowed to mix in, in multiracial schools. So it was going to be a very difficult situation for me. So I was told that, look, the Africans' schools, they are racist. They will not allow you. You must not walk alone at the stadium. When you go to the toilet, tell some of us we will go with you. So I was, I was scared. Obviously, the community was a typical old farmer's community back in 1992. I don't know if they were really, really ready for this. We had certain threats made to us. And, uh, for example, people would phone and suggest that it would be better for Ezekiel not to participate. There was a lot of antagonism, and it was really the hotbed of conservatism. We even had Eugene de Blanche come along on his horse into Potter's room at that particular time. And, of course, we had people who were very strongly opposed to it. And there had been threats. We heard of a bomb threat that was a bomb was going to be put at the stadium. We had a couple of very threatening phone calls to the school at Potch Boys High, which I had to field. I realised at that stage, sport in South Africa must change. And if this is a vehicle to contribute to the change, we are going to use that as, as a means. And we were determined if you could participate in that into work. I was scared really, because I was the only black I will make sure I'm not in, in the bundle when we run. Nobody's gonna come and bump you or say something to you. And I said, the only way for me is to go in front. Whoever wants to catch me, they will get me in front. He started moving ahead, and at 600 meters, he just went away from the field. It was packed, and coming to the last 100 meters, coming to finish, I did not expect that and I just saw each and every one on the stand stand up and clap her hands for me. It was absolutely amazing. We were there. The one group, one school from Comnasium, those children stood up and applauded as he came through. I said, whoa, this is, you know, they, they've got nothing against me supporting me. There was people in the stand standing up to give him a standing applause. That was on Friday night. Ezekiel ran tremendous. And it was just a phenomenal performance. Yeah, no, it was a very special moment. It was a history being made, which I think needed to be made. I went into the toilet. There was these two big Afrikaner guys. And I thought, there's a problem again here. Yeah. I was told not to come here alone, but Nothing happened, you know. They came to me, shake my hands, and say, you know, well done, great athletes. And from there, you know, I was free. That set the table for the next day's 800 meter, which was really Ezekiel's talent for the years to come. And Ezekiel went out 
we discussed it and we ran a tremendously fast time. Qualifying in that competition for the South African Championships, which was going to be held later in the year. I felt like I'm being accepted. People, they see me as Ezekiel, the runner, or uh, somebody who's talented, not because I'm black. What did win the day was that the children, the pupils of the school, acknowledged brilliance because they saw the finest schoolboy runner that had ever been seen. And this was only six weeks after he'd came to Potts Boys High. So everybody knew, wow, this is somebody good. He ran like the wind. He had a most marvelous style. He was very light on his feet. He had a determination as well, I think, in his own self to prove that he could do something and do something well at our school. And that determination we saw right away through his entire career. He proved that all the time. Qualifying for the South African Games later that year, only 16 years of age, Ezekiel came second in both the 800 and 1500 meter events, which were run in world-class times. Acknowledging the country's commitment to dismantling apartheid and instituting free and fair democratic elections, in 1991, the international community lifted the sporting ban against South Africa. In 1992, Ezekiel was selected for the first ever non-racial junior athletics team to represent South Africa at the World Junior Athletics Championships in Seoul, South Korea. As a kid, I always, you know, as I was saying, I, I, the farm there, I would, I just wish I could stand on top of that mountain and be able to see overseas. So I always wanted to go. It happened in 92, South Korea, World Juniors. But between Ezekiel and his vision from the top of the mountain stood one major challenge. Athletic South Africa would not be financing the trip. For Ezekiel to get to South Korea, he would have to do it on his own. At that stage, Potch Boys I has strong old boys societies. We wrote letters to the old boys, and within a week, the necessary funds was donated by old boys to help Ezekiel to, to get to the World Championships. But we still remember the, the local sports shop donated some running shoes and spikes, a jacket and two. And it was one, two, three. The men said that they be my car for Ezekiel to see Nick. The year it is clear for the ten for me. <laughs> First time on the plane. I don't know how I felt, it, it was like... Is it gonna fall? Or what's gonna happen? I mean, there was a stage where we went through turbulence and I said, ah, this is it. This thing, we can't survive. In a certain way, his naivety actually contributed to his achievement because I don't think he realized the enormity of the competition. For him, it was just another competition. He qualified for the final, and in the final, he was placed fourth or fifth. Running a new South African junior record. Yeah, I was fifth. In the final, broke the national record, 147 in the 800 meters, the record that stood for more than 25 years. We were quite proud. I mean, for the first time, a young South African made it into the final, and in that final, ran his, the fastest time he has ever ran, and the fastest time any South African young boy at that stage as run, and he set the first of many South African records in his age group. JP became like a father and a friend to Ezekiel, because even though he was a teacher, he got to know him very, very well, you know, every morning up early, running, in the afternoons, working with him, actually seeing what his breaking point was and seeing how, you know, how he could achieve sitting in my office working and he came to my office and he said, told me, coach, he was invited to run a senior prestige meeting that night and he informed me that he was going to run fast. I think maybe I didn't really know at that stage how fast he could run. And that, that night a whole group of top 800 meter senior men from in South Africa was gathered for the race and Ezekiel set off and he did what he intended to. 
I can still remember the commentator Martin Gilliam made a, a comment that he's seen a rabbit before, but this is ridiculous. He's a world-class athlete and he has the potential to win world titles and Olympic titles. Ezekiel took everybody for a surprise. He won that race with a time of 1.45.8 something, which was then the fastest time for the 800 since Marge Fiascanaro, Dicky Brewerberg, Mark Handelsman, those guys ran. In 1993, Ezekiel was just 18 years old and getting better and better. Ezekiel went on to win the South African Senior Championships and was subsequently selected to go to Stuttgart to run in the World Senior Athletic Championships. In 1993, Ezekiel was only 18 years old and he stepped up there against the best in the world. He qualified for the final and I can still remember a comment that Johnny Gray, a great former 800 meter runner, Olympian, American athlete made and he said that to watch this kid, this is something special. Ezekiel was placed fifth in the senior final. Um, I think it was a great achievement. He again broke the South African junior record, which is still the current South African junior record. And uh, from there, the table was set for Ezekiel to start his international career. Ezekiel Sepeng needs no introduction. Fifth in 800 meters in the World Championships in Stuttgart, South Africa's premier 800 meter athlete, stepping up a little bit to get distance into his legs. For Ezekiel, for South Africa, the time was now. The goal, Atlanta and the 1996 Olympic Games. In Stellenbosch, and moving up fast on the inside now. Ezekiel Sepeng, they're punching. they got one lap to go. It's going to be a fight right down to the wire. Sean Abrams. A long time coming. It had been a long, hard road to a united, non-racial and democratic South Africa. A world where all South Africans could now proudly represent their country as South Africans. This is going to be superb. That, there he goes. That's a uh, Ezekiel Sepeng followed by Johannes Mokwena. Ebenezer Felix on the outside. Frank March on the inside. Here comes Marius van Heerden. Ezekiel Sepeng, the man with the speed. He runs great cross country. South African cross country junior athlete. He's got plenty of endurance. On the 27th of April 1994, for the first time in history, all South Africans went to the polls in the country's first ever non-racial democratic elections. The ANC was overwhelmingly elected as the government of the day, and Nelson Mandela, the first president of a free, democratic, non-racial South Africa. Mokwena doing the running now. Is Ezekiel Sepeng going to hold him out? The boy from Potches to boys high. Johan Garnis Mokwena, the two Transvaalers, one from Western Transvaal, one from Transvaal, charging around. Here comes Marius from here. But while the country celebrated, in 1994, Ezekiel and J.P. van der Merwe found themselves at the crossroads as their coach-athlete relationship ran aground. He was first year at university. I think I lost a little bit of control of him because he was not under my direct supervision as he was at school. And he pitched up late for training sessions. He was reluctant in training, he complained about shoes and sponsorship and he wanted clothing etc. There was a bit of pressure because he was number one in South Africa and he was the man everybody wanted to beat and I don't really really think we were psychologically prepared for the changes that he had to embrace at that stage and uh, it caused me to make a decision, a career decision to move back to Johannesburg and at that stage I felt it was maybe a good thing for Ezekiel to find another coach in order to take him to the next levels that he needed. Uh, we set him up with a coach in Potters Room. Uh, he was at the university. I came to Johannesburg and uh, Ezekiel stayed behind in Potters Room. But good outcomes need common sense and reason to prevail. Once again, standing on the top of the mountain, the vision of the 1996 Atlanta Olympic Games on the horizon Ezekiel realized that he could not do it without his mentor and coach, J.P. van der Merwe. A few months passed, and the next thing I had this knock on my door. 
And he has a young man with suitcases in his hand asking me to help him because 1996 was the Olympic year and he had definite plans to do well at the Olympics. That is going to be Ezekiel Sepin, South Africa's premier 800 meter athlete, superb stuff. There's no end to the running in this man's legs and in his heart. In 1995, I won the World Student Games in the 800 meters in, in Japan, Fukuoka. Then suddenly, when I opened the eyes, it's 1996, and people now again start talking about Olympic Games. Is Ezekiel Sepeng really Olympic gold material? Inside Sport found out. I decided I can, I can be the best in the world. That's what I decided. If I can just get in a good races and have a good time. If you've seen the character and the, the willpower and the determination of Ezekiel, not only at the World Champs but at the Commonwealth uh, Games this last year, you'll see that he possesses all the qualities of a great athlete. I think anybody who, with virtually no experience in their first year of international competition, goes to the World Championships, which in athletics terms is every bit as competitive as the uh, Olympic Games, and Stuttgart in 1993 was the best athletics meeting there's ever been. He went there without any real international experience at all and came fifth. He beat the Olympic champion, he beat the world indoor champion and the European champion. Uh, with a bit of luck, he could have got a medal. And at the age of whatever he was, I think he was 18 then, that really, that's quite phenomenal. As if adding impetus to Ezekiel's quest and uniting South Africans in an emotional swell of pride and goodwill, on the 24th of June, 1995, the Springboks beat New Zealand in a nail-biting final to take the Rugby World Cup. Sporting his number nine jersey and Springbok cap, father of the new democratic South Africa, Nelson Mandela, was on the pitch to share the coveted trophy with the team. It was a great time to be a South African. I saw him running Birmingham at the national championship and everybody in Europe is mad about this man. Ezekiel Sepeng of Fortress Doom, the schoolboy. Obviously we had a, a discussion. We, you know, we, we settled the the differences and I managed to get Ezekiel into the University of Johannesburg that provided him with some accommodation and uh, he got at that stage one of his opponents became his training partners, Johan Boerta. But it's Ezekiel Sepeng, ladies and gentlemen, his first lap was 51. Can he get close to the South African record? What a thrilling performance it would be. He was focused, he was determined and 1996 started off as a very, very promising year. But it's Ezekiel Zepeng, the time 137. This is going to be extremely close to 145. Ezekiel Zepeng, the star athlete of this evening. 145, 3, 2, a fantastic time. The pace that did well. Ezekiel Zepeng, this is the man that South Africa has been waiting for. Keep on training and, yeah, I qualify for the Olympic Games here. Yeah. Hezekiel Sepeng is not only the greatest black role model for South African athletics, he's the greatest black role model for South African sport. And uh, he's perfect for that role because not only is he talented, he's intelligent, he's coherent, and he's a very likeable fellow as well. I could see in the training that Ezekiel was getting faster and faster. There was a pre-Olympic meeting in Durham, North Carolina, and we intentionally wanted to compete in that meeting because we knew at that stage there was a number of good runners from the world that was going to compete in this meeting. We went up to North Carolina. He actually thrashed the South African record and he ran a time of 1.43.7, which was a top time in the world. In one fell swoop, Ezekiel smashed the South African 800 meter record set by Dickie Broberg in 1971 and equaled by Marcello Fiascanaro in 1973. Running the 800 meters in 143.7, in addition, Ezekiel equaled Marcello's world record set in Milan in June 1973. 
the moment I saw him run, he's almost like a natural. For me, he said, my God, this is, this is like, I started, he should have broken Dicky and my SA record long before he did. And never, it was one race, he ran a 600 meters in Petersburg, helping somebody else to, to run an 800 personal best. And had he kept on running that night, he would have broken our record, but he stepped off the track at 600 meters. I'm just nervous, I don't know what's gonna happen this year. But my, for me, my aim is 96, and to challenge the best in the world. Ezekiel went through that Olympics as a champion. I think the person that needed psychological help was his coach, me, because I was nervous, I couldn't, uh, you know, the moment was very big. I actually started smoking again after stopping smoking for a number of years. I get my best number. I saw these numbers, one, two, two, one. Number one and number two, they're repeating themselves. And, and, and Then my friend sent me a verse, Isaiah 40. Then I took that verse, you know, I said, I will read it in the evening and I put it inside the Bible. You know, when I come back in the evening, I open the Bible where that verse is, it's exactly the same. You know, with the night before the race, I dreamt I was competing at one, one race and, and I got a bronze medal. Difficult to get a phone call. There weren't cell phones, so I sent him a telegram saying, he's my golden boy, he must go for gold because I know he can do it. In the morning, I went for breakfast. People keep on telling me, hey, Zekiel, you can win this competition. And I keep on saying, no, I'm young. This is my first Olympic Games. And I know that I'm in shape. I've ran good in the heat, I've ran good in the semi-final. But I, I did not have that belief that actually it is me, Ezekiel from Pochettstrom, from Boskop in the farm. I put on my number here, God help me, give me power. Very small, so that people can see it. It was only me and God that knows. And what be the plans to be the Olympic crown? There was so many people from the camera that in my head was. And people from the stad was all the time in the house, by my head. Gewaagd, let the tape go. This will be a great race. Then the gun goes off. My mind is, Ezekiel, stay at the back. Don't go in front. Because if you stay at the back, then towards the end, you're in shape, you will pass. I stayed first lap, I'm at the back. The bell rings. Back straight. I thought that the guys were gonna go hard now. We were punched. And that's where now the numbers that are talking to me. One, two, one, two, two, one. The message I've, I've, I've put here, the message I got from my friend, the dream. And immediately I said, God help give me power. I'll put my legs up, we'll put them down. And I just saw myself moving up, coming in, out. Suddenly, we 150 to go. I'm in the inside lane. I'm punched, I can't move. We come into the 120. I had to draw a little bit back so that I can get out of the box and go wide. CP will be very late. A great finish coming up. Rodal goes up, joins Gray, takes him. Kip two. Between 80 and 50, I was third. Literally, was it sure as Then I kept pushing and passing the second guy. I thought I was going to go for that gold medal now. But yeah, it, it was too late. Can't get to him, but Kip to it. Zolet Rodal stopping, hanging on, get there. She's really in trouble. Get me the food. Ezekiel was lost in the last 200 meters. And he had to basically 
ran around all the competitors because he was in a tactical bad position. And if that line was three or four meters further, his eagle could have won gold. He set a new South African record. He ran a time of 142.71, which was amongst the 10 fastest times ever ran in the world at that stage for the 800 meters. Everybody was celebrating. I, I just became the first black South African to win an Olympic medal. Looking at our history that we could not compete internationally. It was so full in my head. And when I did on sing that more fruit. On slow the start net so on sing was so blind and the men so van the plus of the vet men so le com le com me like let ook gekik. Wake up in the morning. I was in the front page of the newspaper in in Atlanta. And in Atlanta, people were telling me they feel close to South Africans and I made the front page. They're talking about me, where I come from. And uh, did interviews, people phoning that there's a bash, street bash in Soweto. Phone home, my mom said, nobody in the farm is going to work. They were giving off day because they waited for long in the evening for that race in porch in the city. It was just happiness. I was watching Sipeng there with my family and, you know, it was hard. It was honestly, it was very hard because seeing him and knowing him, one, the tears was one of the most exciting response. And seeing him now finishing in the second place, that was the double the tears. And then that tears combined with excitement, the celebration was all over South Africa. Boy, to see him come out the side there from absolutely nowhere. If the race had been another five meters, he would have won. But it was just splendid. There was our schoolboy running with the best in the world and nearly being the best. And he was a South African star. Back in Potchefstroom, I can remember still the newspapers and the reporting about him being welcomed back as their son into the community. And that made a full turn from the boy that started off in 92, the reluctance there was for him to compete, and the way that he was embraced after winning the silver in Atlanta. Marius von Jerden and coming through on the outside, Sean Abrams, that is going to be Ezekiel Sepeng. Ezekiel Sepeng, the star athlete of this evening. Sepeng can't get to him with kick to it till it throws out. One of the most commendable things about Ezekiel's career is that he, for 10 years, was among the best runners ever in the world. And some years it went better than other years. In 1998, I got a silver medal at the Commonwealth Games. Then, 99, I was again back in the shape where I was in 96. You know, look at my training and I feel good. I've done few competitions now in Europe, in the Golden League meetings, and I've done well. Ezekiel Sepeng of South Africa, who won the silver medal at the Atlanta Olympics, the first black South African to win an Olympic medal. But his best race was in 1999, when he won the silver at the World Championships. He went also after the World Championships and set a, a new South African record, which is still the current South African record for the 800 meters. The plan was 300 meters to go, go is again. And that's what I did exactly. You know, I moved, I was like a horse. I was so focused that, that it was like I'm running by myself with this no body in front of me. The last hundred I was in front. Oh, Ezekiel, is this the day that you are going to beat Wilson Kipke and become a world champion? Is this happening to me? I did not answer myself. It's 20 meters to go. Then suddenly I saw that a yellow spike of Wilson Kipke that touched in front of me. He went into the line, naturally I pushed him a little to fall so he can dip. 
and that was only what separated me so I, I always feel that was one of my best race because I was experienced I knew what I want there was no questions that can you do it can you not do it I knew I can do it and I give it a go Rosiki Kaiter literally had to dive for that finish line in order to beat Ezekiel he did well in the overall series. He was uh, ranked that year second in the world and f for consecutive years after that year was ranked amongst the top runners in the world in the 800. I, I love it. Number one, it's my event. And number two, I think South Africa has had a good tradition of 800 meter runners. Great, great talent. Who also should have done better had he run from the front. 2004, I went to the final again at the Olympic Games in, in Athens. And actually that was the end of me. After Athens, I told myself, look, you've done very well in athletics. There's young guys that are coming up. This is the time for you to retire. Ezekiel is a great coach now. But him, he's now the age that I was when I was coaching Ezekiel. We often joke about this. And I think, Saying this nicely, I think I'm in a little bit better shape than what Ezekiel most <laughs> probably is. I'm proud of him. I'm excited about his involvement in coaching. I know that he has big plans and I wish him well. He's implementing those principles that we used to get him to international form. He's using those principles to get his athletes on to the right form. Keza made me start running. By Keza made me running, Posh Boys identified me because of my running, and Mr. Blake took it from there. Yeah. From John Blake, then there came JP. He ended up being my father. You know, he did everything for me. He would give me his old running shoes, which I don't have at that time. He would take me home. He wanted me to fit at the school, because most of the kids, the parents will come and take them home. Some of them will go for Sunday lunch. So he, he, he was actually doing all those things for me. I can phone him at any stage, and I know that he knows that both of us contributed to each other's careers tremendously. It was not only my contribution to him, but also his contribution to me. Where in the world does a South African teacher get an opportunity to be involved with one of the world's greatest athletes ever? So Ezekiel definitely also influenced my life and changed it forever. And for that, I will be forever thankful to him. I had a great time. <laughs> uh, yes, I could have maybe done it better, more conservatively trained, better, but I had a great time. Got friends all over the world and we laughed a lot. We cried, <laughs> cried a bit, but I've no regrets. Oh, I could have done better. No, I've had a great life, I was blessed. Set in 1973, Marcello's Italian record for the 800 meters still stands unbroken today. Revered in Italy, Marcello has been given freedom of the city for both Formia and Castabono and has been made a cavalieri, the equivalent of a knighthood, by the Italian government. The gutsy way he ran in the European Championships, is, I'll never forget. His first race, his first 400 meter race against Donald Tim, when I could see the potential. Uh, setting the world record without any shadow of doubt. I must motivate our youth with my story, where I come from. Whatever I have, I would like to share with, with somebody. And I would like to see kids that are coming from the same background. We have more black Olympians. Now we have more black medalists. Now we have more black kids. To put it straight, I did not only inspire the black kids, I inspired the youth of South Africa as a whole. I was supported by white parents at Poch Boys. They made me who I am. I'm grateful with my life here. Yeah.